Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are here. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Have regard for the covenant, O Lord. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Covenant, O Lord, let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Oh.
almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you have promised, make us love what you have commanded, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the 13th Sunday after Trinity is from 2 Chronicles chapter 28. The men of Israel took captive 200,000 of their relatives, women, sons, and daughters. They also took much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord was there, whose name was Oded. And he went out to meet the army that came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he gave them into your hand. But you have killed them in a rage that has reached up to heaven. And now you intend to subjugate the people of Judah and Jerusalem, male and female, as your slaves? Have you not sins of your own against the Lord your God? Now hear me and send back the captives from your relatives whom you have taken, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Certain chiefs also of the men of Ephraim, Azariah the son of Johanan, Berechiah the son of Meshillamoth, Jehizekiah the son of Shalom, and Amasa the son of Hadli, stood up against those who were coming from the war and said to them, You shall not bring the captives in here, for you propose to bring upon us guilt against the Lord in addition to our present sins and guilt. For our guilt is already great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the assembly. And the men who have been mentioned by name rose and took the captives. And with the spoil, they clothed all who were naked among them. They clothed them, gave them sandals, provided them with food and drink, and anointed them. And carrying all the feeble among them on donkeys, they brought them to their kinsfolk at Jericho, the city of palm trees. Then... They returned to Samaria. This is the word of the Lord. Epistles from Galatians chapter 3. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. The 
Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Turning to the disciples, Jesus said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to, the, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jericho to Jerusalem, excuse me, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, He had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you need, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God and Son of God, the God and His Father before all worlds, God of God. Thank you. 
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text is the Gospel lesson. The title for our message this morning is Straight Talk. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So today, we have the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? Of course you do. It's one of the greatest hits album of Jesus. Right up there with the feeding of the 5,000, the parable of the sower. We know this story. But if you pay attention to the context, it is still confusing. Jesus, or this parable is occasioned by a lawyer who asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus gives us this parable, which should make us Lutherans a little uneasy, because he tells the story of this Samaritan who helps somebody else out. So, in other words, what must I do to be to inherit eternal life. Is Jesus saying you need to go and find some hapless victim somewhere and heal them, save them, rescue them? And then there's also the fact that the lawyer asks Jesus the question, who is my neighbor? Who am I called to help? Jesus tells this parable, and then he doesn't say who are the neighbors you're supposed to help. He says who proves to be the neighbor. Is that a straight line for you? Do, is this making sense, what this parable is all about? Because if it is, help me out, because I, I don't get it. Jesus does not seem to be talking straight. And if nothing else, we can start here. Jesus isn't talking straight. Maybe it's because this man is not talking straight to Jesus. The evangelist Luke tells us that this lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test. Everybody say, "Uh uh-oh. 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 Putting Jesus to the test. Is that a good idea? Seems like I heard a story where Jesus says to the devil... You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That's on the greatest hits album too. When the devil tries to tempt Jesus. So could we agree that right out of the gate when the motives behind the words are to test Jesus, that's a bad idea? Could we start there? So then why don't we think it's a bad idea when we test Jesus? Why is it that we try to play things two different ways? Why is it that we'll have the life that we want everybody to see, the church life. And then we've got the hidden life. And they're not the same. There's that life where 
We think things, we say things, we meditate on things, we do things, and that life we don't want anyone else to see. And so we hide it with this other life. I think sometimes maybe we think we're hiding it from God. In fact, (laughs) we can say the right things. We can say all the Lutheran things like, um, you know, I know, I, so I'm a sinner. And you know the Lutheran things. We can, in other words, you can have good theology and talk about God and know about sin and know about Jesus and his death on the cross. And you can talk about those things in such a way where you keep it at a distance because you don't want God to talk to or to touch that inner life. You talk about God rather than letting God talk to you and touch who you are and deal with the real issues. And we have this way of talking and saying things where we can put the best construction on our own behavior. Yeah, I know I did wrong, but at least... We can talk about what other people have done wrong. We can meditate on what others have said and done. We'll talk about wanting peace. We want contentment. We want life. And then when we're surrounded by God's word, when we're singing the liturgy, when we're singing hymns, we will focus on the fact that, boy, I heard this last week. Or, I don't, this melody isn't doing it for me. Or, we'll treat the word of God as if it's a chore, as if it's putting, we're putting in time throughout the week. Saying one thing and doing another, holding on to another, protecting something that we don't want to let go of. The point is that we don't trust God to. Like we're hiding something. Like God doesn't know. We're putting God to the test. And listen, the lawyer's religious. He's a teacher of the law. He knows God's word. He knows the right things to say. But his heart is far from God. It's a problem. Why do we ever entertain the notion that it's wise or safe to play games with God? As I was pondering this, it sort of came to me that The issue is we're trying to play games with God's law. So in the story, lawyer says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, what does the law say? Do that and you will live. Namely, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And so we're told the man tries to justify himself by saying... And who is my neighbor? That's a game with the law and it makes absolutely no sense. You've heard the saying that there's no such thing as a dumb question? It's a dumb question. Who's 
my na- who are the people that I have to help and the people that I'm free from helping? What good is going to come out of that question? Or how far can I go before I actually break the law? That's just playing games. And it's no, why would you spend your time thinking about how far I can go without breaking the law? Wouldn't it be better? Doesn't it make sense? Isn't it true to say what can I do to actually love God and love my neighbor? What can I do to fully embrace the truth? What can I do to fully live? How much poison can I take and it's still okay? The fact that we would say, well, yeah, I know it was wrong, but they had it coming. Is that healthy talk? Is that straight? It's just a game. To find things to point to, to to validate ourselves, to say, hey, I'm okay because at least I did this. In dealing with our sin, to try to explain it away or put the best construction on it. How is that? All that is is trying to take the law and stay alive. It's not actually dealing. It's not a, we're not actually facing the law. We're trying to avoid it. The point is, we get into trouble when we play games with the law. Try to somehow use the law to say we're, we're, we're okay. And the truth is, according to St. Paul, here's what the law does for you. It puts you in jail. The law in other places, we're told, condemns us. This life where we're trying to say one thing and then also another, this life where we are trying to hide from God, the law has this way of coming in and finally we have to deal with and shows us for who we really are and there's no hiding. The law has this way of taking our two lives and sort of integrating them into one. And so we stand condemned, imprisoned, put to death by God's good and perfect law. So, Using our experience, you take a look at this reading and I think one thing becomes increasingly clear. Who are you? What's your identity? According to this, you are the one who was who had fallen among robbers, you were stripped, you were beaten, and you were left half dead. That's who you and I are. What are we going to draw from? How are we going to prove otherwise? How are we going to, what are we going to accomplish by our own reason or strength? What is it that we are offering 
that is true, lovely, admirable. In other words, think about, you know, we talk about our enemies being the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. We talk about that in catechism class. Yeah, I know, I know about that. Well, the, Let's just talk about our own sinful nature. Let's talk about our own minds. Let's talk about the fact that we are so ready to focus on things and to embrace things and to ponder things that are not true. Think of how often and how easily we say things. We live out of the stories that we've made for ourselves and we say things that are not true. Instead, we say things that are hurtful, that do not give life. I mean, can we agree that when this man is laying there half dead on the road, he's probably not thinking clearly and he's probably not speaking clearly? That's a reality. Here's what the law finally shows us you and I are sinners. My problem is not other people. I mean, think about it this way. If, if everyone was more concerned with their own sins than they were concerned with what other people are doing, to trot out the old cliche, wouldn't the world be a different place? The law has spoken. What else do you have to confess? What work do you want to hold on to? What do you want to show others and to show God that says, you're right, you're okay, you know what you need to know, you've got it together. What is it that you're going to say? I think the story is telling us we've only got one thing left to say. I'm a sinner. And if that's the case, then this story continues to speak to us because the story is not over. The story says that there is a good Samaritan. The story says that there is a hero. The story says that there is one who was actually away from us, that is an outsider from us, not one of us, even an enemy in our minds, and yet he saw us. Now who's that? I heard a few people whisper it. Let's say it together. Jesus. The Good Samaritan sees the man who's helpless, who's beaten up by the devil, the world, and his own sinful nature. The Good Samaritan, Jesus, sees you. All of you. That part that you've been so desperate to keep from everyone else. He sees. And he doesn't walk away. He doesn't hold his nose. He doesn't close his eyes. He doesn't try to get around you. He sees you and he has compassion. He can't help himself. He is drawn to you. He wants to be with you. He wants to save you. He comes. He's done something. He's doing something. You want to hear some straight talk? Do you want to know what God is actually saying to you? 
Look at how God speaks when he gives his own son to bleed out and to suffocate on the cross. And while he's there on the cross, notice the way he speaks. He doesn't say, I don't deserve this. He doesn't say, woe is me. Here's what he says. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Here's what he says. There's a man who is dying next to him who says, I deserve what I'm getting. I am a sinner. And he calls out to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today, I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. Is Jesus being ambiguous? He's made it clear that he has come for sinners. He's made it clear that there is life and it's yours. He's made it clear that there is a kingdom and he wants to bestow it all on you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. And not only has Christ seen you, not only did he suffer, not only did he die, he rose, and even now, he continues to care for you, he brings you into the inn of his church, he sees to your wounds, and he begins to help you so that you think clearly, and that you see clearly, and that you start to say things and think things that matter, and you start to gain strength. And you start to use your body for things that are actually life-giving, that are noble, that are true. I don't know if I understand this parable fully. But I do know this, that I'm the beat-up man in the story. I think you are too. But Jesus has come, and he's done something. So that if nothing else, part of the gospel is that we are done playing games. When we sin, we don't have to pretend. We don't have to put the best construction on it. We can just simply say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I have nothing to justify. I have nothing I can do to prove. I will let you justify me through your son. I will let his blood speak for me, and his blood speaks a better word, a truer word than I could ever speak on my own behalf. And now I'm done trying to justify myself. I'm done playing games. I remember September 11th, 2001, Some terrorists hijacked airplanes and flew them into the Twin Towers, the Pentagon. One was flown into an abandoned field. And I remember that day being confused. Why is this happening? Why would God allow this to happen? And then I remember getting a phone call from my church, and it was a message that said, tonight we're going to have a worship service, and it is a service of prayer and repentance. And I thought to myself, why are we repenting? They're the bad guys. We are the victims. And then, over time, 
as we prayed those words of repentance, it came to me that these words of confession are true. That the problem is not terrorists. The problem is my sin. And if that's the problem, then there is amazing news because God has done something. And that's what I want you to go away with today. I know, you've heard this message before. Hear it again. God sees you. God sees you. And he loves you. And he wants everything to do with you. He will stop at nothing to make you his own and to live under him in his kingdom and to serve him in everlasting righteousness and innocence forever. And that's the straight truth. In Jesus' name. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, your Son has triumphed by his cross. Give grace to your church to proclaim his victory throughout the world. The victory of the love that hate could not destroy and the life that death could not overcome. Lord, in your mercy. Bless this parish, that we may grow in our knowledge of the Lord and our love of his commandments. We also lift up to you our fellow congregation and our circuit, Zion Hastings. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, by our wickedness we merit many of the evils that befall us. Nevertheless, cut short your wrath. Make room for repentance and forgive us for the sake of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers for our country and the nations of the world. Overcome war, hate, and bloodshed by peace, justice, and mercy. Keep safe the soldiers and servants in our armed forces. Lord, in your mercy. Father, into your loving hands we commend those who have requested our intercession, especially Vicki, Maxine, Dan, Rose, Bill, Linda, Mary, Ruth, Carol, June, John, D. Also Shelley, Rodney, Tom, Jenny, Kara, Gail, Keith, and Dwayne. Lead them out of all their troubles. Lord, in your mercy. God of all righteousness, you command us to be holy as you are holy, and you sanctify us with your Son's body and blood. Prepare the hearts of all who partake of the sacrament today that they might repent of their sin, trust in your promises, and find their righteousness in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have granted us to live in the accepted time when we may hear your holy gospel, know your fatherly will, and behold your Son, Jesus Christ. We implore you, most merciful Father, let the light of your word remain with us, And so govern our hearts by your Holy Spirit that we may never forsake your word, but remain steadfast in it, and finally obtain eternal salvation through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying...
Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks... He broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, strengthen and preserve you, both body and soul, to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Peace to pray. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.